Welcome to Wadsworth History on Film, a program presented by the Wadsworth Area Historical Society and designed to record the oral history of Wadsworth for posterity. I'm Caesar Carino, your host, and our guest today is Pat Brannigan. Pat, you've been around for a long time in Wadsworth. Mm -hmm. Although you're not a native, you might as well be a native because you have enmeshed yourself in the fabric of Wadsworth so well and so profoundly that we probably consider you a native. When did you first come to Wadsworth, Pat? February 5th, 1948. He knows the date. And when were you married? <laughs> uh, July 17th, 1948. And he remembers that as well. Oh, I should. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. Most people don't remember those dates, but you remember when you were married, when you came to Wadsworth and so forth. Me. What brought you to Wadsworth? Well, uh, the uh, directorate of the Wadsworth Brick and Tile, that was the corporate name then, had a good friend on the board, and uh, a good friend of mine on the board, and he decided that they needed some uh, up, a reorganization, and Wilbur Cook, the general manager at the time, was leaving in 30 days, so mm -hmm. they had to have some help. Wilbur Cook was a, a long-time resident of Wadsworth. He had uh, two children, um, <clears throat> a boy, and then he also had a girl, Margaret, Margaret Robert and Margaret were Cook, and they moved away. Um, Margaret would be about 67 years old, and a brother would be... Um, about 71 years old, but of course Wilbur Cook is already gone. Oh, yeah. Now, who was the member of the board that uh, was a friend of yours? Uh, Alden Fletcher from Painesville, Ohio. Alden Fletcher mm -hmm. from Painesville was a friend of yours, and we where were in, you at the time? We lived in Painesville, uh, except at that time I was at Ohio State. And he called and wanted to know if I would come up for 90 days, uh, because Wilbur was leaving in 30, to stabilize the transition, and uh, turned out to be... 35 years. <laughs> 30 days, you're going to stay there for 30 days or 90, 90 days? days? 90 days. 90 mm days, -hmm. and you stay for 35 years at the Brick and Tile. 38 years. 38 years. 38 years. Wow. That, um, that's, that's a longer time than probably anyone else has ever been there. Has anyone ever been there that long? No, I think Wilbur Cook was there 24 years. And you were there 38 years, so you actually are Mr. Brick and Tile, Wadsworth Brick and Tile. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you remember about the Wadsworth Brick and Tile when you first came and what changes you made. We have some pictures. You have tons of pictures, and we're really pleased with those. And uh, maybe you can tell us um, where, where it was when you came. Uh, the plant, of course, was located in the southwest part of the village. Maybe uh, we can hold that up a little bit. All right. And uh, had 16 periodic kills, which were beehive type. In other words, they were cyclical. You filled the kill, fired it, took it down, emptied the kill. And um, had a small network of dealerships, uh, mostly uh, nearby, with some rail transportation to Boston and New York and Chicago. Um, we operated the plant for two years, from 1948 until 1950, April, and General Clay Products Corporation of Columbus, Ohio bought it. And then there was real... But before that, it was the Wadsworth Brick and Tile. Locally owned with 91 stockholders and uh, directorates such as Frank Hilliard and Henry Kreider and Joe Bender, Raleigh Abel, who was the principal stockholder, was president. And um, on the board also as Secretary Treasurer was uh, Paul C. Wyke, who at that time was a great renowned attorney in Akron, who went on to become the district judge for the 6th District in Cincinnati. And a very prominent career. Died, mm -hmm. died a couple weeks ago. At nearly uh, yes, years he did. Old. I read that in the paper about his having died. I didn't realize that he was associated with the Wadsworth oh, yes. Brick and Tile at the time. Well, he had married a Rickard girl from Wadsworth okay. who was part of the makeup of the Okay, ownership. the Rickards. I didn't mm -hmm. realize that either. Mm -hmm. So uh, Judge White. Wyke. Wyke, I'm sorry. Judge Wyke married a Rickard girl mm -hmm. from Wadsworth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, would that be Frank Rickards? I think so, and then, of course, additionally, the other Rickard girl was the wife of Alden Fletcher, and that made that connection. So, ah, uh, so the Rickards. Alden Fletcher and Paul C. White were brother-in-laws, and uh, the two girls from Watchworth were their wives. Now, that that's something we did not know, and I don't mm -hmm. think it's in any of the historical so. data that we have about Watchworth. Um, Raleigh Abel, you say, owned uh, the biggest part yes. of the uh, brickyard. Uh, Raleigh Abel... Um, is a um, grandfather of Tom Cox. You know? Yes, yes, yeah, good friend Tom. Yeah, <laughs> uh, grandfather of Tom Cox and Raleigh Abel owns some farms also um, west and north of Wadsworth. Mm -hmm. um, he also had the first Oldsmobile, I believe, in Wadsworth. Is that correct? Undoubtedly, uh, uh, his so. brother, I believe, was an auto dealer. Auto dealer. And Raleigh also had a principal ownership in People Savings and Loan. 
which was an Akron at the time. Here, in Wadsworth. Oh, well, the People's Savings Loan in Wadsworth. Mm -hmm. he, he owned part of that mm -hmm. then. On Main Street. I went to school with his daughter, Donna Abel. Yeah. And for 12 years, I didn't mm. even know that they had Penny One. <laughs> she was the nicest person in the yeah, whole world. Very modest. Very, very modest, the whole family. Um, the, um, the, the, that's an extended family. We, we were talking about that family and another uh, issue of Wadsworth, the history on film, so we won't get into that one today. But we'd like to get back to the brickyard, if we could, just for a couple of seconds. We still call it the brickyard, even though it's, it's a Wadsworth brick and tile. Terminology the general, won't go away. <laughs> uh, the uh, general brick and tile. What happened when the general brick and tile from Columbus took over? What, what were some of the changes? Well, it was General Clay Products Corporation. Our General Clay po Products. Who had an existing plant at Baltic, Ohio, with main offices in Columbus. And Baltic, uh, the Baltic plant is now what? Uh, general Clay Products. And still is. Was, was there, wasn't there another one in Belden? Well, Belden has six plants down in that area, Sugar Creek area. Okay, and what is uh, where the Belden brick was at one time? Uh, Canton, Sugar Creek, Eurexville, New Philadelphia. Okay, but isn't Belden Village part of what used to be the... Uh... Well, uh, that's kind of a myth because there are so many Beldens in the Canton area that the oh, Belden see. Village people are different from the Belden Brick. Belden Brick okay. We just wanted to make sure that that's, that's uh, recorded for historical documentation as well, that it's not the same brick company, or they're not the same Belden that has the brick. Cousins, they are. They're, but they're cousins. Yeah, okay, along that's with the Belden Blake Oil Company. Belden Blake cousins. Oil Company. It's good and for us to know that. Attorneys and developers. General Clay Tile from Columbus. General Clay Products. I'll never get it right yet. <laughs> Brickyard. The General Clay Products from Columbus. And what did they change when they came here? And how did you fit into that change? And well, um, it was a transition that uh, was evident from the start that they had the financial resources and the interest and the ambition, having experience with a plant they continually owned, that uh, they wished to develop this plant. It had assets, it had uh, materials, it had capability, the, ton the uh, periodic kills were there. So, Tell us what a periodic hill is. I'm sure that no one knows. Well, it's a generic term describing the beehive kill. Beehive, but it looks like a looks beehive. Looks like a beehive. Okay, but it's huge, right? Oh, it's huge. It's 36 feet across. 36 feet across. How high? Uh, about 20 feet. 20 feet high, okay. Uh, with a non supported dome that was built in a crown so that it was a, under that principle of a wedge support, mm -hmm. forcing against the perimeter. The and, Roman, the Roman um, cornerstones, yeah, right? Roman arts and 16 openings that provided access for coal penetration and uh, uh, every 20 or 30 minutes the firemen would go around and fire it and uh, it took about two weeks to complete the firing cycle and you had to wait a few days to cool and then open the doors and go in and take the material out. It was cyclical, in other words you put the material in, you fired it, you took it down and uh, yeah, 16 kills gave us a pretty good rotation. And this is what you, what you found when you came in 1948? So, then you changed what? Well, the first thing uh, they, bought in, they brought in and uh, established a, a handling system uh, for packaging and uh, uh, so to eliminate the hand process, in other words, six brick at a time and a tong, they were put, uh, in contrast to that, they put them on pallets and strapped them on a pallet and you'd get 500 brick at a time and limit the amount of cost uh, that was involved in hand handling. And then began to develop uh, the uh, process um, with uh, more modern facilities to get the raw material out of the clay pit into the bins for grinding. What, well, do they have the clay right there? All oh, the clay's right there. That was one of the things we had to overcome from the start. Uh, uh, you know how rumors go, uh, when I first went there, the people were questioning about the potentiality for the whole plant. But uh, the plant now has something like 700 acres versus 300 when we went there. We acquired land over the last 40 years. And is it and, just uh, by coincidence that clay is there or is clay everywhere in there? No, it's, uh, it's, in fact, it's rather scarce. Good raw material shale of the Anthony type is um, fairly rare. Could you explain what the Anthony type means? Well, it's, a, it's a, a vein that exists in the hillside so that when you access it and mix it with other portions around it, it will uh, become a plastic material forcible through a die and uh, attainable so that uh, in time after firing it retains its shape, it's endurable, it's long lasting, and it requires some colors that uh, you apply by their chemicals or firing and uh, attain a range or a, a section of beauty.
that's what bricks are. <laughs> uh, they also are, are very durable. That's right. Now, um, you change from the kiln type with the cyclical type of kiln to what and when? Well, in 1956, uh, uh, we built plant four from scratch one. 56. 56. 41 years ago. Right. And that was a, a, an automated, continual tunnel kill operation. You put the brick in on one end on Monday, and seven days later, they come out the other end. Fired, cured, ready to be handled and processed or blended. And it took care of a lot of handling versus the other mm -hmm. old, older way. Now, in contrast to that, we continued plant five in the periodic kill for another uh, 10 or 12 years until we had enough funding to go ahead and establish two plants here. We had plant four in 1956, and in 1966 we had plant five. Both op operated under an automated, robotic, computerized programming. I understand a little while ago that you said that um, the firemen would go around for every 20 minutes or so and stoke the fires and all of that. Um, <clears throat> since the, the tunnel kilns were um, what, uh, automated to the point where... 62. Uh, well, 66. 66. They were automated. Mm -hmm. uh, did you use coal at that time? Oh, no, no. Oh, we, went, we abandoned coal about 1962. About 1962. Mm -hmm. So you went to what, gas? gas. Where would you get the gas? Well, we brought in from East Ohio Gas, one of the largest lines they have. We were probably one of their largest uh, customers. You didn't drill for a, a gas well no, in your property? No, uh, little assurance that we could obtain enough. If we found some, the laws were set on our contract that we had to submit it to them and let them ah, feed it back, mm -hmm. which is done in some cases. There's, all, there's always a rub. Now, um, was there any difference in the brick that came out of the end of the, the long tunnels as compared to the beehive tunnels? Yes, the beehive gave us the capability of firing in ranges from red, brown, black, green, and gray. Uh, gray. Uh, the tunnel kill operation, being gas fired, had limited uh, opportunity for that. So we had to create some innovation to either slow down the kill a little bit, slow down the firing, and ignite at opportune times to create uh, browns and tans and greenish shades, not the same type as we acquired in the beehive kill when we applied zinc for green, manganese for black. And that material would float in and um, adhere to the surface of the brick and be in about a quarter inch deep, uh, giving it permanence of color. Is there, do you have any, any, any examples of where someone had to, um, say, for instance, build a building in 1940, 45, or 50, or something like that, and then uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years later, or four, 30 years later, had to um, add to the building, but, but does that mean that he, could, he or she could not get the same color brick? Uh, likely, although the opportunity was there for us, the responsibility was somewhat questionable because our, our philosophy and sophistication of, in, of, the, of the processing of machinery changed all that and eliminated just many such uh, needs. Uh, we, were, uh, we were trying to do the best we could to match. Um, but uh, in some cases, uh, uh, in a lot of cases, EPA came along and said we couldn't use manganese or zinc to do those things. In any operation, we were creating effluent in the air and. Uh, uh, we had to restrain that. So, in so other words, you, the, the color of the brick now is is going to be different. Natural. Uh, uh, it's going to be well, whatever is natural is there, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's an interesting aspect of it. Tell us who were some of the people who worked at the brickyard. We'll call it a brickyard all the way through. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a strange term to me because I've been trying to obliterate that for okay. all these years. It's really General Clay Product Corporation. Uh, the administration of the corporation. Uh, from, say, uh, the Board of Directors on down, uh, I mentioned, of course, Abel, Bender, Kreider, Hilliard. I mentioned Frank Hilliard, I believe. Alan Fletcher and Paul White. Uh, we, uh, we had plants also acquired over those years at Baltic, uh, the resisting plant, Baltic, Ohio, MacArthur, Ohio, Logan, Ohio, Hartford, Connecticut, Lisbon, Ohio, Newcomerstown, and Nelsonville. And we were uh, part of a big chain then. Yes. Mm -hmm. We were second in the state of Ohio and either 12th or 14th in the country. Wow. We were capable uh, at our supreme days of uh, capacity at about 160 million brick a year. That's a lot of brick. That's well, what did you high. do with the brick then? I mean, just 
pump them out and well, start them somewhere, or did someone uh, order them ahead of time? What, how did you do that? In the way that we sophisticated much of our operation uh, through handling materials and packaging and so on, we could cube this material and pile them four high and uh, create extra warehousing. But our dealers became also aware that they needed to take inventory in in those times when we were perhaps slower, mm -hmm. and then create openings for us to go ahead and run um, at the early part of spring. In lots of cases, the winters were so bad, uh, I remember the winter of 1964, 63, uh, it was uh, 20 below zero. Hard to get raw material. On the 20th day, on the 20th day of January of 1963, it was 27 below zero, and I got a flat tire. <laughs> well, we had lots of inopportune times out at the plant because the material was frozen. It was impossible to dig it out of the hillside. You couldn't process it properly, and uh, the people were freezing around the plant trying to obtain uh, package material. But uh, back in those early days, uh, Caesar, to your original question, uh, we had people like Rudy Masura, plant superintendent in 48 to 1952, Abe Mass from 1952 to 1957, George Skaggs from 57 to 62. George, say George's last name again. Skaggs. Skaggs, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He came to us from uh, Connecticut. From Connecticut. And um, then John Everhart from 1952 to 1978. And John's uh, wife just died. Yes, Irene, Irene just, just died away about last week. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Bert Bueller, who became a general superintendent over the six plants that we had in our system at now that time. Now, is this Bueller related to any of the Buellers in the grocery no, chains? No, not that I'm not, aware not of. Not that we're not. Okay. No. He was from uh, Pekin, Illinois, and currently lives around Evergreen, Colorado. Okay. And Bob Potts, of course, you know Bob. He Bob Potts, very, very famous person here uh, in Wadsworth. Mm -hmm. A great guy in operating the plants, and uh, his wish and ambition for complete satisfaction with the customers. And, uh, now, Bob's uh, retired. Bob's retired, probably five or six years now. Bob had a horrible accident down there one oh, time, didn't he? Bob uh, was a strange victim a couple of times. He, uh, what happened? He um, was dri driving a bulldozer, as I remember, wasn't he? He was operating a bulldozer on a high cliff area mm -hmm. and wanted to get to the opposite side. And he started around, and there was such an incline on that area that the bulldozer started to slide sideways. Mm -hmm. And the grips were, of course, in that direction. And he wasn't able to turn it, so he got traction. And the thing slipped and fell right over the side of the hill. Uh, he was a desperate personality at that moment, trying to save the, the equipment, but uh, that quickly turned on him. And the next effort was to save himself. He fell over that cliff about 45 feet. 45 feet, wow. Mm. I remember he was very, very bad shape, but yes. he came out pretty well. Yes, he did. He's an in indomitable shape. spirit. Indomitable <laughs> spirit. He's, um, Bob's about 74 years old now or more, uh -huh. maybe 75, mm -hmm. and uh, still very good shape and right. so forth. That's wonderful. And then Steve Markovich, who is the uh, brother in law of the current owner of the plant. Now, which Markovich, which, where does Steve live? Steve lives on Seville Road. Seville Road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He has a couple daughters, I believe. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does Steve do now? Well, he's superintendent. He's the stu mm -hmm. Steve is the superintendent of the, mm -hmm. of the General Clay Tile. <laughs> General Clay Products. General Clay Products. Part of the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, then Gene Eiler uh, came with us uh, in 1983 and is still there as Gene Eiler. Gene Eiler. E Y L E R. Oh, E Y L E R. Yes, mm -hmm. okay. I was thinking of I L E R. E Y L E R. Mm -hmm. Gene Eiler. Mm -hmm. And we had Betty Berkey. Betty Berkey. What mm -hmm. did she do? Betty Everhart Berkey. Right, exactly. Uh, she was in our office as. Uh, um, all kinds of duties, uh, from dispatching to uh, payroll early. Um, then her sister-in-law, uh, Margaret Everhart, came Margaret with us. Margaret came, that's right. And Dale's uh, wife, Dale Dale's Everhart's wife. wife. And, uh, but uh, actually, Betty came there in about 1940, didn't she? No, uh, we hired her in 1951. 51? 51. I thought she had worked all the time at the Brickyard, no. the uh, ones with clay products. And General Clay. She worked from that on until she retired about yeah. 1975. And Betty's gone now, isn't she? Betty died. Mm -hmm. She died. She mm -hmm. moved out to Wyoming, I believe, to be with her son, <clears throat> who continues to live out there. Mm -hmm. And Margaret retired, Margaret Everhard retired about uh, two years ago. Uh, at one time, we had as many as uh, 150 employees in the two plants. Do you remember any of the stories from the very early days of the Wadsworth Brickyard, I mean the Brick and Tile, 
Um, what kinds of people worked there? Who worked there? And what was the uh, the nature of their their employment? I mean, what did they do? What, mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of things did they do? Well, we had, uh, of course, uh, early times uh, in the fifties, we had. Uh, Need for people with uh, good strong arms. Strong and arms and strong backs. Mm -hmm. And the hackers uh, would remove the brick from the off bearing belt away from the uh, die and the, and the uh, extrusion area and put them on kill cars, size so that they would go through the dryers. They were in the dryers about three days. <clears throat> we had to have people tending the dryers to see that heat was up uh, to scale, uh, schedule. We had to have people at the other end of the dryers take them out and prepare those brick on kill cars to go into the kills. And uh, removing brick from those uh, killed dryer cars was a major job because that required a uh, real adeptness to handle brick endlessly two by two and put them in those kills so they were stacked into a crown area so that the firing which occurred from day one then could penetrate about 75,000 brick. And over that next two week period then be sure that the firing was maintained on a uh, a kind of a curve so that it rose uh, to get rid of the water. And every pound, every brick, there was a pound of water to be drawn out. Wow, a pound of water in and the bricks. And you had to be careful. You didn't assault that. It, you couldn't seal the material. You had to extract it and make it completely dry and then raise the temperature on up to about 2,100 degrees and maintain that for probably three or four days to cure it, to set it. And then uh, as you increase the heat, you also had the opportunity to decrease the heat. And you couldn't accelerate either of those for fear of cracking the material. Pat, before you started working with bricks, did you know anything about bricks? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I knew they were around. We you had knew some they were around. That was about it. Um, I did have the opportunity to go to Washington for three months uh, in the early 50s uh, to the now known as the Brick Institute of America. Oh, that's interesting. Tell us about that. I think that uh, mm -hmm. we had talked about this once, and I think that um, probably no one knows that this exists. What's the other name for it? Well, earlier it was known as Structural Play Products Institute, SCPI. Oh. SCPI. And it's the authority, it's the establishment on which all brick companies in this country who are members rely for direction, for the uh, assessment of the American Society of Testing Materials, which is our Bible on how we conform and, and um, rely on their specifications, which become architectural specifications, and identify materials that are acceptable, long-lasting, maintain color, size, and the premise that it's an aesthetic product that's acceptable for years to come. Now that's the scientific part of it. Uh, is, there some, is there any kind of a, um, oh, for the want of a better word, a, a collector's item part of uh, bricks? Oh, yes. Yes, I happen to be one. You're one of them. <laughs> Tell us about the collector's items. Well, we have bricks. material here that just we've shown earlier. What's though. this one? That is a uh, brick that's uh, uh, a solid. It's a um, molded brick. Molded brick. Yeah. A different from, say, this one, which is an extruded brick. What's a molded, molded brick is molded? like a series of bread pan trays, and the material is forced to it. into compression and then molded with that little, what we call a frog on there. The frog. Uh, where the, the frog. Uh, name can appear and that identifies that product as being made by an Ohio manufacturer. And this one is an extruded brick. How yes. is an extruded brick made? Well, an extruded brick comes out of a die and sliced off like okay. well, loaves of bread this way. It's formed by a long column. Okay. Uh, like toothpaste. This seems to be a little bit smoother than this one, a little bit more true. Is that mm -hmm. accurate? Well, this one, of course, is an architectural type brick. It's the third designation that those non-uniformity edges and sizes and so on are expected. Oh, I see. That is symbolic of what was known as the colonial type brick from the East. Ah, okay. Early production where they had scove kills in those days. Scove? Yes. Scove kill would be about the size of this studio room, about 20 by 20. And Spell scove, S-K-O-V-E. S -K -O -V -E. Mm -hmm. And uh, those institutions uh, were pretty much a family-owned uh, operation. In fact, Ohio uh, had the opportunity to bring brick making into the state in 1812 in the Marietta area, where um, that was our first one. First one, and uh, it was pretty much a, a family-oriented thing. People uh, um, uh, moved about, and uh, they moved from town to town. And in those days. There was likely to be a brick plant of sorts in every little town. Now, just they out of curiosity, mm -hmm. my father 
Um, <clears throat> Carson would be 104 years old on the fourth day or the 16th day of August. When he was all the way from eight years of age until he went to the service, which was probably age 17 or 18 in Italy. <clears throat> and the reason I'm bringing this up is that they actually had in that little community of theirs an mm -hmm. oven that made bricks, mm -hmm. and that's what he did. Mm -hmm. And yeah. my sister-in-law, Nancy Carino, her father, Frank Guglielmo, also worked in that same identical <laughs> place, and it was a family <clears throat> affair. Now, they, it wasn't our family. I mean, it was somebody else's family. These people uh -huh. just worked in there. And they said it was a, an oven that looked about like a kitchen, mm -hmm. and they would, they would uh, make bricks like this. Can you get me one of those? I, I wish I could. I wish I could. I have a brick, uh, and moving on, this is a very special brick, with the, with made to be commemorative brick. because it has greetings on there. Ah, season's, season's greetings. greetings. Okay. This brick what here. What's this then? What well, is this that's brick? a slab from a panel, and there would be 15 others like this on a panel, identifying this brick by range of color, texture, size. Mm -hmm. And I, I, for convenience sake, I brought just this one. Okay, this is face brick, right? You face brick. You can just put that on something. Uh... Oh, no, it was full size like this. Oh, I see. Yes. Oh, oh, I see. We this. cut that off for sake of oh, okay. convenience. Okay, in other words, you would put the brick this way instead of up and down. Right. What's this guy? Well, this is unusual, Caesar, in that it's a brick from Bartlettsville, Oklahoma. And being a collector, I am very proud of this, and it's a treasured item made by the Indians in Indian Territory. Oh. And it has all kinds of symbols on there that mean something to them. I happen to have a uh, um, reference here that, uh, that identifies that. Uh, it's a uh, part of what is known, for lack of better terminology, as a part of the organization that covers collectors for barbed wire and brick. And they're for barbed wire and brick. <laughs> so, this one is, is quite valuable. Uh, that one, Dr. McCandless brought me back a brick from England out of near Windsor Castle. And it's an angled corner shape. It's probably 14 or 15 inches on each section, solid. He carried wow. that on the plane for me. It's I'm surprised just unbelievable. <laughs> well, he. Probably a weapon. <laughs> now, uh, of course, if anyone can do it, Dr. John McCandless could. He's very clever at anything that he does. Um, that brick isn't too terribly true. No, not meant to be. That, yeah. that, that was made in probably the likes of a Schuylkill or something approaching that, right. where you build up the material and covered it with wood, and that, the, the that, brick themselves were the kill. That's, I see. Self-contained. Um, you, you prize that. Oh, yes. But I'm sure that if you gave that to a bricklayer, he slap it up with his hammer, wouldn't he? Probably because would. <laughs> uh, it, it takes a good deal of... Uh, philosophical training to make bricklayers universally acceptable on all types of materials. <laughs> but I do have others. Uh, I have a portion of two brick from um, uh, Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. Really? Uh, from um, Greece, Italy, and Austria, where my daughter brought some home for me, Peggy. Uh, Peggy? Peggy? Now, she is Peggy the, um, the wife of uh, astronaut? Yes. Tell us a little bit about that before we go too much farther, because I think that's part of what was, that no one has ever been able to come up with, and that is uh -huh. the fact that one of our, our own Wadsworth girls is married to an astronaut who has already been on a mission. Is that correct? Yes, twice. Twice. He was up in Tell us over. about that one. Well, As a matter of uh, fact, here's the patch. It says Smith, Tanner, Lee, Harbaugh. Holly, Horowitz, and Bowersock. Which one is yours? Smith. Stephen Anna. Smith. Point to him, right please. Here. Right there is Stephen Smith. Mm -hmm. Right there. Tell us about Stephen Smith and about uh, the astronauts <clears throat> and all of that. Well, Stephen has had an ambition to fly in space. Boy, he sure to go. <laughs> since he was in third grade. He identifies that uh, his mother has saved all of his uh, drawings from those days, mainly which were of shuttles and uh, space vehicles and things of that type. And... Uh, um, Steve has tremendous tenacity, uh, determined that this was his way of life uh, as he could try to obtain it. He applied five times before he was accepted. Mm. And uh, each time it was getting knocked down for various small, trivial reasons. The final time he applied, there were 2,000 candidates, 2,000 applications. Wow. They boiled well, that down. You can down be sure that I was not among them. <laughs> 25. And uh, with great elation, he found out uh, in 19, uh, 
1992 that he was accepted. Well, good for him. And uh, uh, prior to that, of course, uh, Peggy had determined she wanted to go on for graduate degrees and had gone to Stanford for her MBA, where she met Steve in 1987. And they were married in 1989 uh, during the time of the dilemma of the earthquake, mm -hmm. October 22nd, 1989. Had to move the cer a wedding ceremony site from Palo Alto over to the central part of Palo Alto uh, in a church built in 1905 of some brick. Brick? Um, <laughs> you wouldn't permit your daughter to be married in a brick. The, a church and wasn't brick, would you? This church, even though surrounded by buildings that were uh, just distraught, uh, survived. Now, this sounds like a commercial to me. All the rest <laughs> of the buildings were annihilated, but the brick building was still yeah. there. Well, you, as a matter of fact, in a couple of minutes, I'd like to have you show us some pictures of exactly what you're talking yeah. about there yes. in Wadsworth. Yes. But go right ahead, please, with uh, more about Steve Smith. Well, Steve, of course, flew uh, September the 30th, 1994, uh, on the Endeavor, uh, retracing the steps of an earlier mission six months uh, prior to that and assessing the world's assets and resources, natural resources, flying over those same sites and seeing how mountains move or lava moves or uh, assessing with great penetration their new um, updated um, radars that determine even though we don't know about it yet uh, at that point, uh, the underlying cities that existed in some of the deserts in northern Africa. No kidding. And but now, this, you didn't by chance ask him to look for any veins of good clay, did you? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> that is a limitation on, on space and time of delivery right. distance. But uh, he made that mission very successfully uh, after 11 days. And then this year, uh, February 11th, he launched on the Discovery for the Hubble mission. Uh, they were up uh, 10 days from the 11th to the 22nd, the 21st evening. And uh, uh, he had three spacewalks, first, third, and fifth day. The fifth day necessitated by uh, the need to repair the Hubble itself. The, now, I can't even talk about this, but they actually get out of the ship and they're standing in midair. How high off the ground? <laughs> well, they're 350 miles up. 350 and miles up, and nothing between them and Earth or the land, no right? No ladders. <laughs> what keeps them there? Well, the fact that it requires 17,000 miles per hour speed to exit the world's gravitational section. And once they um, enter that area of being gravity free, then that 17,000 miles an hour speed keeps them in orbit. Now they have to do some little booster work uh, to get up additionally to the exact height. And they were chasing the Hubble. I can't even talk about it, it's so, so frightening. And he's out there. <laughs> well, the third day he was down. out there, the oh, third, first, third and fifth day of the spacewalks. And uh, their mission was, of course, to update, repair if necessary, and um, uh, modify those things on the Hubble, which uh, goes on to serve as well with cameras that are portraying history way, way out there. I mean, it's so far that it even scares me. Well, you uh, know, we used to talk about Peggy as being your daughter. I think we now are going to say that you are Peggy's father. <laughs> um, it's been a thrill. Peggy has been um, is married now to a very, very famous astronaut. But you have other members of your family, too. Tell us about them. They're those people. The, uh, the members of your family have all done very well. Well, son Jim is with Science Applications Incorporated in La Jolla, California. He's a project director. Uh, recently been uh, featured in some um, areas of hospital care for most of Canada and has been very successful with some multi-million dollar contracts for his company. Uh, son Tom, next in age, uh, is a radiologist and lives in um, Rancho Bernardo area. Um, California. California, and so is Jim and practices radiology uh, services for uh, his group at uh, Grossmont, a 400-bed hospital, and also at Temecula Hospital, a 200-bed hospital. And he serves uh, those needs in both areas, um, much of it interventional, which is a, a sidelong expertise that exists with examination after radiology. Mm -hmm. um, so daughter Peggy, the next in line, is married to Steve, and they live in Clear Lake, Houston. Uh, the NASA astronaut uh, sector. Uh, Bonnie is uh, in living in Columbus, married to Mark Sellers. They have two children. 
they're here at the moment, mm -hmm. and as is Steve and Peggy. Um, Bonnie is a vice president of Max and Irma's restaurant system. Isn't that something? <laughs> Doing very well. She probably would get more fame from being that than, than Steve will be for being an astronaut. <laughs> I doubt the they're vast, competing, but... Uh, for the, math, for the vast number of people who like Max and Irma's. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she does. She's extremely happy with it. Uh, daughter Carol, married to John Grandy, who is a regional manager for Sterling Jewelry. They live in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then we have one more who unfortunately passed away. Yes. Well, we have two more. Two more? Yes. Rick was killed in a train railroad yes, accident right. in Illinois in 1970. He was 20 years old. And we had uh, daughter Sheila who died at birth. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. That's right. I forgot about Sheila. Mm -hmm. But that family is just an outstanding family, and you have so much to be proud of. And certainly, uh, Steve is helping to make you proud. But let's get back to the brickyard for a All couple right, minutes fine. because we have so much. We're not going to be able to finish you in an hour. <laughs> but um, get, getting back to the brickyard, um, how about some of the workers in the brickyard, <clears throat> people who actually did? Do you remember any of those names? Oh, sure, yes. Um, <clears throat> Guy Mills, we talked about earlier. Uh, Guy Mills, right. Guy, now, this is an old, family. old guy. He'd be over 100 years old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he had a large family. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there was an Afro-American family. And um, mm -hmm. they lived on Mill Street, but Mill Street was not named for that Mills family. It was mm -hmm. na named for another Mills family, mm -hmm. who, which um, came mm -hmm. from Stony Ridge Road. Um, now called West Reimer Road, or just mm -hmm. Reimer Road in the west part of uh, west of uh, Route 94, um, and they had about seven mm -hmm. or eight children. I've forgotten how many they had. They had a lot of children. I thought it was nine. Nine children, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. one of them was a physician. One was a principal of a high school, and uh, one graduated with me, Levi Mills. Mm -hmm. The reason they called him Levi, his mm -hmm. real name was Guy Mills, but yes. the reason they called him Levi was that mm -hmm. when he was a little boy playing football. Down in um, uh, Franklin School, um, the uh, people like Ed Bates, for instance, would be playing football with him. Of course, mm -hmm. Ed Bates is 10 years older than Levi, and <laughs> as far as he was concerned, Levi was a little kid. You know how well, older people sure. are. But Levi <laughs> was good. Boy, was he a good ball player. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't let him play because they were 10 years older, and this little kid was always <laughs> messing around with him. And so huh. Guy Mills, Jr., the little one who is now my age, or about my age or so, said, Levi, play with it, rather than let me play with it. Levi, play. Uh -huh. Levi, play. Mm -hmm. So that's why they call him Levi Mills. Mm -hmm. And uh, Levi is in California, mm -hmm. very close to where your kids oh. are. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that he purchased a little plot of land out there many years ago, which is now a resort golf course. And mm. Levi has made it very mm. big. So the Mills family started mm. with an old guy mm. working out there with Mm -hmm. Just plain labor work, mm -hmm. hard labor work. I don't know that the poor man could even read and write, could he, do you know? I don't know. Possibly, I'm not sure. I, I think to a point he could. could to a point, just yeah. minimally. Mm -hmm. But um, by golly, he came by with a family that's oh. just absolutely uh, outstanding here in Wadsworth, yeah, mm -hmm. the Mills family. Who are some of the other people who... Well, back to the Mills family for a second. I think the uh, father image there was so prevalent that he was able to instill, along with Mrs. Mills, the need for performance, the need to accept the system and go on and use it mm -hmm. to the tune that education was the most important thing they thought they had. And boy, they did. They too. did. Mm -hmm. Now, um, their work was the same level. They, they performed well, they were on time, they were there every day, and um, consequently the product worked well. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, um, we had Nunzi DiPietro. Nunzi, right? Nunzi was, he's dead now. He died of yes. Bruce Gary's disease. Yes. Nunzi would be 60, mm -hmm. 60 years mm -hmm. old right now. His wife is Madonna mm -hmm. DiPietro, mm -hmm. who uh, just retired, I believe, or no, is still working as a teacher at Sacred Heart School. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Nunzi, about his, his well, prowess Nunzi, as a strong man. Yes, Nunzi was very strong. Extremely um, strong. Along with uh, then an older gentleman, John Yonkich Sr. John Yonkich Sr., yeah. He could lift one end of those kill cars. We always thought it was a thousand pounds, and he could get his shoulder and do a major lift with all those good abs he had oh, at his goodness. age. And he was probably, uh, compared to Nunes, he was in maybe 18 or 20 at the time. Uh, John Yonkich Sr. must have been 60. Oh, at least that, because yeah. he would be an old, old man now. But he, like the Mills family, had great discipline. Um, 
you know, not too much ice cream and uh, the good things they could buy and eat. That's right. Did you have some, some families living right on the brickyard? When I went there, that was the way it was uh, for a long while, um, 1948 to 1952. Unfortunately, we had a 17-week strike mm -hmm. in 19, May of 15, 1952. Lasted until October, and the business and the inventory evaporated. So when we went back to work, there wasn't any business. We operated about three weeks and shut it down until February or March of the following year. Wow. Had to restructure and, of course, lost lots of employees who uh, found it impossible to endure the stress that went with of that. Of course. Bills course. went on and need to eat and do normal things went on. So we lost a lot of people who uh, went to other businesses around town, uh, Injector, Barefoot. And we found that the nature of our company was such that we could encourage um, younger, younger folks, um, even more so in the uh, summertime, when we relied heavily on college students to come mm -hmm. in. Dan Sandals, John Parker, Tom Parker. Now, Dan Sandals who was a vice president at um, Westfield. Westfield, was worked at the Brickyard. <laughs> who was the other, John Parker? John Parker and Tom Parker. And what do they do? Uh, they're both doctors. They're both physicians, <laughs> right. They work right. at the Brickyard. Yes. Anybody else? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm sure there would be. Uh, it slips me at the moment. But uh, uh, we had a cadre of about 15 uh, older senior employees at that time who knew what quality was. Uh, they could instill that. Do you remember who some of those employees were? Wilbur Huffman. Wilbur Huffman. Mm -hmm. Okay, I remember Wilbur. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Holm, and I can't remember his first name right now, H O L M. Uh, uh, he lived in Silver Creek. Uh, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'll, come, I'll come up with his name in a few minutes. And uh, several Leathermans. Which Leatherman families? Now, there are three or four Leatherman families. Yeah. Which one? This, this family was not part of the original ownership. Going back to 1904 when the company was formed. It was Not that family. No. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, we had, Wadsworth has been blessed with lots of Leathermans. Oh, yes, and good people mm -hmm. too. Wonderful. Now, Don Leatherman's father was involved in ownership uh, up until about 1928, I think. Or maybe I beyond that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Frank Leatherman. What, um, <clears throat> what about the people who lived at the brickyard at the time? that you closed it down for that period of time. Where did they go? Did, they, did you evict them or did no, they have to leave or um, what? They, uh, How many families lived there? Oh, probably six. Six or families. Mm -hmm. And they were all Afro-Americans, were they not? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that point, going back earlier, um, housing was hard to get in the 40s in those days. And in the, the wartime, 1940 to 45, I believe, uh, the machine shop area of our plant was devoted, along with the Wellman Corporation, engineering company of Cleveland, to making tank parts. So it was good to have access to this talent on site. Mm -hmm. And they were delighted to have the housing at the same time. But it became a stressful matter as the plant wanted to expand, as we wanted to build Plant 4 in 1954. It was evident that land had to go as far as housing. So uh, by mutual agreement, we decided, and it was opportune during the strike because um, the plant gate was locked, so there was not transportation back and forth. So many of them moved. The Jackson family moved over to um, State Street. Others moved to Akron, to Barberton. Uh, some continued to live here. Do you remember who some of the families who lived down there? We knew that the um, Jacksons, uh, Leon Jackson. Jacksons, two Appletons. Appletons, right. Uh, Hightower. Um, Hightowers, right. There were two others, and I don't remember the name. I can't think of their names right now, but I knew who they were, because I used to go down, to, sure. down there. Well, we had a, a nuisance attraction down there. A nuisance attraction. What we was had that? A big, we had several big ponds, and it was known not That's only right. for fishing, but for swimming. They called it the Brickyard Pond. And several of those trees would hang out over the pond, and it created a great diving opportunity. Now, did we lose any people in the yes. Brickyard? My understanding is that four people were lost over 50 years. In 1949, 46 or 47, a young lad from Wadsworth High School died at the Brickyard Pond. Yes, uh, Robert Bordeaux. 1950, when uh, Harold Epler, the then owner right. of the plant, <clears throat> acquired it, and he had an insurance inspection. And um, uh, one of the provisions that came out of that acquisition was that the insurance company restricted any of that activity. 
we had to make concerted efforts to eliminate that opportunity for um, that nuisance attraction. That's right. Now, mm -hmm. what caused the ponds? I mean, you didn't build them on purpose. Oh, no, no. Some of these we got overnight. Uh, the one, the bigger one down there, the biggest one, um, came as a surprise, although it happened before my time. Uh, I understand they were digging for shale, and these That's are 35-foot right. cliff high walls. And they had the equipment parked in one end. Of course, you had to operate at a level where the material was available. That's right. And then build behind you and prevent the water out. Um, thought it had well done. Except that the morning they came back, the machinery was buried in buried water. Buried in water. That's right. I remember that story. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, what well, happened? Uh, apparently, uh, a spring untapped at that point was struck. And uh, water has a way of kind of progressing and comes down off of that sloping hillside and uh, decided to fill that pond. Is the machinery still down there or did they, I, did they get it up? I think they got some of it up, but uh, we've had Navy divers in for two reasons, to check the potential for making it a, a, a spawning area for fish of various kinds. We stocked it at various times. And then at the same time, we had them go down and explore the bottom and see what's down there. You know, there's everything in the world down there, tires and auto bodies and probably that equipment. Do you have any, any feel for how those, those um, auto bodies and tires and things got down there? Well, they're rusting badly. They're rusting badly, but <laughs> the they tires, probably just uh, um, The tires probably uh, could be taken out. Mm -hmm. But I'm um, saying that, uh, how, who put them there? Do you have any idea? Well, um, it became an obsession with people mm -hmm. uh, to uh, have an old car and run it off a cliff side and disappear. That would be the it. And I think there were, uh, uh, there were instances where we were asked to be cooperative about uh, finding or investigating opportunities for our stolen cars. That's uh, exactly right. That's what I was trying to get at because yes. we had heard, I mean, the rumors around Wadsworth were that if, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, if you couldn't find a car, it'd be down <laughs> at the bottom of the brickyard pond. Uh -huh. we, we have no knowledge that any of that existed, mm -hmm. although it was a point for checking. Well, it's a nice way of getting rumors started, though. <laughs> <laughs> they started that. Now, we need to get back to some of these other people and some of your lists there. You have some tremendous lists, and you have some other th kinds of things that you have done. Mm -hmm. you, a while ago, you mentioned that um, you were part of this brick collection place, and that you also were heavily involved with the Brick Institute. What do you call that, the Brick Institute of America? The Brick Institute of America. Of America. Mm -hmm. But you also are heavily involved with some other uh, high-powered, high-level kinds of organizations, not only here in Wadsworth, but in, in, um, in Akron. Uh, rather than mm -hmm. letting me ask you, how about reading off some of those things? Because um, this is one of the reasons that uh, we wanted to bring mm -hmm. you in. A person who has adopted Wadsworth and who's been here for the past 50, what, uh, well, 60 years. 49. 49 years. 49 years. Mm -hmm. Almost, yeah, that's right, because you came the year that I graduated from high school and we're having our 50th anniversary next year, so <laughs> that'd be 49 years. Um, a person who has been here this amount of time and has done this much. Share with us, please, um, Pat, some of the things that you are involved with right now, and one of them is going to mm -hmm. surprise many of us. <laughs> Go ahead and I'll pick that, pick that one out. All right. I um, uh, was one of the founders of the Wadsworth JCs back in 1952. Uh, in 1957, I was one of the founders of the Wadsworth Gyro Club. Okay, now that's one that mm -hmm. um, very few people have any knowledge about. Uh, they think it's some kind of a social club. Tell us about the Gyro Club. Somewhat it is. It's a fraternity of men, businessmen, and, and professional men. Um, Started in 1912. 1912 where? Case Western Reserve University. Case Western Reserve University. By and is it just in Wadsworth? No, no. It's an international club. International group. club, and we you were uh, heavily involved with that. Well, uh, fortunately, the then uh, president, international president of Gyro, lived in Painesville on our street. So when I came to Wadsworth, I thought, gee, it'd be nice to have a similar type of group here in Wadsworth. And I got Chick St. Clair, and Alden Fletcher was a Gyro and Lou uh, Reynolds in Cleveland and uh, uh, several others, and we, we formed a group, beginning with Bob Gehring, Ed Bates, uh, Jack Sommer, uh, Ed Rook, uh, Stan Geary, and we, we, we found 10 gentlemen, and that 10 found another 10, and we found another five. We had people such as Earl Gutwell and Sterling Sechrist for our, our original founders, and it's gone on, and we're celebrating our 40th anniversary. 40th anniversary. Tell us what the Gyro Club does. Gyro Club is a fraternity of men. 
And uh, probably illegal now, isn't it? Because of, <laughs> you don't have any women in us. Well, uh, we have no women members at this point, but um, we have uh, great um, social events, uh, dinners, banquets, uh, parties of uh, uh, installation type nature. We're having one in about 60 days. Um, current president is Larry Flieger. Um, mm -hmm. Incoming president will be uh, Kurt Thompson. And it's a, it's a group uh, designated to uh, maintain, obtain perhaps first, and uh, maintain a good relationship, respect of man, and consider that you have a friend. Um, as an example, uh, how many friends can you count on two hands who are real friends who could take any confidence you had and, and exercise goodwill with it? That's so true. That's so yeah. true. Mm -hmm. uh, Who are they, some of the members you have now? Because this is a really a huge organization. Jay Bajorek, Dr. Bianco, Ed Bates, Mike Bates, um, uh, Ken Durr was, um, um, Bob Freeman, uh, Larry Flagger, Walt Gehring, Bill Razor, um, Bill Raftree, Joe Sterling, um, Dr. Uh, Warner, Jeff Warner, uh, Steve McElvain, uh, Bruce Manning, Bob Smith, about 25 of us. You have a good memory. Wow, <laughs> you went right through that. Well, let, let, read some of those other things that you did. Okay. Done. Well, I had the good fortune of becoming acquainted with the opportunity to join the American Legion mm -hmm. uh, about the time I came to town because Frank uh, Hillier, another good friend, um, was a past commander and very interested in the precepts of the American Legion. And Frank Hilliard was on the board at... Uh, on the board of our plant. Of, of the plant down so in the backyard. He inveigled me in the office one day to hand him the dues, and I was a member. And shortly after that, Mick Dick Geisinger, who was a good friend and... Now uh, dead. Now dead. Married to... Um, Ethel. Ethel Hollinger, Hollinger. I, Geisinger. And Ethel Hollinger is at St. Edward's home. Yes. Uh, but not as a resident, but she lives in the independent living mm -hmm. there. Uh, she is probably mm -hmm. close to 90 years old at the present yes. time. Mm -hmm. uh, Dick and Ethel became good friends through our activities at the Legion. And in 1952, uh, I was the, elected the, command, uh, the, the adjutant, and the following year was elected the commander. Those were good experiences. We but that means that you had to have some more experience, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> what, was, what were your war experiences? Well, I entered the service in March of 1943, um, trained in Virginia, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Um, was transported to Seattle, Washington, where we went to Hawaii from there by boat. We were in Hawaii for seven months and then went down into the Admiralties and prepared for the invasion of the, of, uh, the Philippines. That occurred October the 20th, 1944, made the first day invasion. Um, we covered that uh, activity until uh, February of 1945, prepared then to go for the invasion of Okinawa, which occurred Easter Sunday morning, April 1st, 1945. And those were memorable. I wouldn't want to do it again necessarily, but uh, it certainly makes you aware of what the values sure. are and the virtues of this country. So when you came back then, you joined the American Legion. And you, in order to join the American mm -hmm. Legion, you have to have um, service yes. under your belt. And then you became the commander of the American mm -hmm. Legion. That's so different from anything that you know, Pat Brannigan stands for, not that <laughs> it's different in terms of philosophy, but uh, everything mm -hmm. that you've always done has always been highly professional and so forth. Not that this isn't professional, but it's a, almost always a social kind of a thing for mm -hmm. and you were the commander. Well, the Legion, of course, is social, and uh, but treasures those things that constitute uh, um, our continued virtues for this country. Surely, absolutely. And, Tremendous and I organization. We have to, uh, I hope we never lose it. Oh, gee. Um, I've been good, fortunate to have been on the board of directors and the chairman of the Wadsworth Whitman Hospital from uh, 1975 to 87. You were one of the first members, were you not? First? First, uh, when the Wadsworth Whitman Hospital was being organized. Um, no, not necessarily. I was probably 10 years after that. Oh, 10 years after mm -hmm. that? I thought mm -hmm. that was when you started. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and currently I serve on the governance board of the Wadsworth Whitman Hospital. Um, past director of uh, Citizens Bank from 1964 to 1975, and the old Phoenix Bank uh, Advisory Board from 76 to 86. Um, I had the pleasure of serving with the Business Advisory Council for the Wadra School Board for about three years and uh, three years ago. That was a good experience to bring some of the activity and experience that I've had in business to relay to uh, 
that 15 member group uh, the input that's necessary to make the transition at whatever level in high school for those freshmen, sophomore, and juniors and seniors that when they exit school that they have an opportunity to understand the needs to go to business if they want right. to go to want to go into business or uh, industry and do not have the opportunity to go to school they should bring some great talents with them where's the opportunity to make an application mm -hmm. and uh, feel that they're giving the employer some return um, I am currently a member of the Phi Kappa Theta fraternity of Ohio State um, I've been past president and member of the Brick Institute of America for Region 4, which is about five states up here. Um, that's pretty much my activity, uh, Caesar. Uh, it's been all entwined and currently, I guess, leading to when I retired. Well, don't you want the ARDB, the Akron Regional Development Board? Right. I represent the <clears throat> ARDB. I think you and Sterling Sikas are the only two was with people on the ARDB. Uh, Wadsworth people, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have about a half a dozen from the county. But like you from Wadsworth. Medina, Brunswick, uh, Valley City. Um, it's been a very unique opportunity for me. The day I retired, uh, they came to me and wanted to know if I would uh, <clears throat> uh, carry their banner in the county of Medina. Where did you, when did you retire? What year? 87. 87, okay. Mm -hmm. And then the ARDB came and asked you if you would um, mm -hmm. be one of the people for... Make contact with about 250 to 300 companies in the county. Mm -hmm assessing their needs, whether it be economic development, finance, land, opportunities, business, advisory uh, situations, or uh, uh, unemployment commission, or workers' comp coverage, health care, cellular telephones, uh, a whole array of things that we have. And all meant to sustain those companies and retain them here. But more than that, 15% of the time bring in new companies. So they don't have to ask you directly your age for the, for the record. I'll never tell. How old were you when you retired? <laughs> <laughs> Just barely enough to get another job. Just barely enough to get another job. <laughs> it's been good. Probably has helped me uh, enjoy life. I, I do these things for ARDB at my own direction, two or three days a week perhaps. And it gives Joan, my wife, and I the opportunity to uh, visit our children as needed. Uh, in California or in Texas with Peggy or in... Joan, your wife, I'm going to interrupt mm. you quickly here because we have only a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes left. <laughs> and Joan, your wife, needs to be brought into this because she has had an extraordinary career here in Wadsworth as well. Do that. Tell us a little bit about that one. Well, Joan was at Bowling Green when she decided to uh, that uh, we could be married mm -hmm. in, in 1948. And uh, the uh, director of journalism at Bowling Green was a good friend of John Miller's. Of John Miller's and who, who was the editor, editor of the Wadsworth, of the Wadsworth Banner Press right. and then the Wadsworth News Banner. And I think, uh, uh, to her credit, she hadn't been in town more than a few hours, and John was calling her That's to wonderful. see if he would, if she would like to uh, be a part of his staff. It was probably one of the most significant moves she ever made. Uh, it's been good for her. It's been good for me. Uh, it's been good for the family. And John Miller certainly was uh, 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 just a. Uh, paragon of information and, and concern for all of his employees. It's very, very good. Uh, how many years has she been at the News Banner or the Wadsworth uh, News Banner Pride? Well, she started in 1948. Uh, so that's almost 50 years and she Carol still writes. Ma yes. Oh, yes. She still writes because I see her column all the time. She interviews people. Mm -hmm. uh, she, um, She's had interviews with uh, President Ford, mm -hmm. um, uh, Mother Teresa, uh, several other dignitaries who are usually speakers at uh, the E.J. Thomas uh, mm -hmm. platform and does it on a journalistic basis. Mm. As we close this hour, we're going to have to say to you, Pat, that we're going to have to invite you back because we still have all of these pictures of um, the things that, uh, just as an example, uh, just one quick one. What's the biggest mm. building that was with brick and tile has ever supplied for, for which was the brick and tile or the general tire general clay products. products. Have to get the name right. I get the name right. <laughs> Brickyard uh, supplied for uh, a building. Well, about 10 years ago, uh, we were providers for the tallest building in Sarasota, Florida, a bank building. And uh, that came as a result of having an architectural connection in Columbus. Uh, we probably put a million brick down. A million brick down there. That's wonderful. 
Pat, thank you again for being with us this hour. We're going to invite you back for another, another session a little <laughs> later on because there's just too much to tell in, in one part. 50 years in Wadsworth almost, and during that period of time, you've done as much as most people have done in 100. Thanks again, <laughs> and we'll talk to you later. Thank you for the opportunity very much. Hello, Wadsworth. Roger Polk from The Ultimate Game here to remind you to clear your calendars. Saturday, October 6th from 8 to 2 is Wadsworth Bone Marrow Registry Day. As declared by Mayor Caesar Carino and the City Council, we are going to attempt to get as many citizens of Wadsworth as we can out to the Wadsworth First Church of the Nazarene on the corner of High and Browse. Saturday the 6th from 8 to 2 to get registered into the National Bone Marrow Registry so that we can save a life for someone either in our local community or throughout the United States. This is operated by the uh, American Red Cross. All they're going to do when you come out, it's a very quick procedure. You fill out a consent form. They'll take a small vial of blood. They'll type it and put you in the registry. So we're counting on you, Wadsworth. As many as we can, let's shoot for a thousand. We don't know how many to expect. Let's try to get as many as we can from Wadsworth. We'll see you October 6th.